Oops. All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to Office Hours with David Anita, episode 20, Identifying and Mitigating Spring Frost Damage in Vineyards. Today's presenters will be Con Curterell, Mark Batney, and Larry Bedega. I have a few short announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank um, our extension partners. Truly without them, we would not be able to bring you this type of programming. I'd also like to thank you all for attending and thank you to Caroline for logistical help, especially with Zoom and helping to register some folks. And also thank you to our speakers today who I just mentioned, Khan, Mark, and Larry for sharing their expertise and time with us today. In addition, I'd like to thank Anita and Dave as well as our hosts. As far as housekeeping items, please stay muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the chat box or raise your hand in Zoom to ask live. Closed captioning is enabled today. You can turn it on and off in the meeting controls. And at the end, we will eventually send you a survey. Um, we would love for you to fill it out when you receive it. It really does help us to know what works and what does not with these types of programs. And finally, a recording of today's program will be emailed to you about 48 hours after we finish. And we'd like to thank you all for attending today and we'll get started in a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. Khan Kirtrell. So he's my equivalent on the viticulture side, a associate specialist in, um, extension specialist in viticulture. Um, I don't know if everybody knows, but Khan joined the department in November of 2015. It feels like he's always been here. But um, before that, he was at Fresno State. And before that, he was at the University of Kentucky, which always interests me. And he Khan did uh, his master's and PhD degree at the University of Southern Illinois, which I also always find interesting because I keep forgetting that. As you know, Khan has a wide, wide range of research that he does everything very applied for the industry, as well as basic research, mechanization, disease pressure, you know, how you can increase efficiency in your vineyards and many other things. And it's because of this broad range of knowledge that we are able to respond to your questions and your needs. And so this is why we're today having this office hours to identifying and mitigating frost damage in the vineyard. And hopefully, we can at least know, tell you today what we know, we don't know, and give you the best results or the best advice that's out there. Thank you, Khan, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Anita. Um, like Anita said, uh, I spent uh, uh, a different career uh, in the uh, Midwest uh, working on uh, cold hardiness, uh, frost avoidance, uh, et cetera. So I was uh, happy to uh, move to California when I was uh, recruited, uh, not to have to do that work, but uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we are uh, seeing these uh, events in uh, California now. Uh, so 2019, 2020, 2021, now uh, 2022, uh, uh, although uh, they started as uh, isolated cases, now uh, these uh, frost events are coming down as uh, you know 200 uh, mile bands. Um, so, Anyways, uh, they're uh, certainly uh, uh, unavoidable uh, when they come in uh, at that uh, scale. So I won't take up much time. Uh, I know uh, people have a lot of uh, questions. I'll uh, go through some uh, basic concepts. Dormancy and uh, bud breaks. As you know, uh, we do need uh, some chilling for our uh, grapevines. However, uh, for our uh, European uh, grapevines, uh, which we are growing in uh, California, uh, the period of uh, chilling is uh, quite low. Uh, and uh, uh, unlike, uh, you know, American grapes, which may require uh, 1,000 to uh, 1,200 uh, chilling hours, uh, we uh, might get away with uh, about 100 for uh, vinifera. That's why uh, during these, uh, you know, warm spells, uh, we push our buds quite uh, early. Uh, looking at it, uh, as far as uh, dormancy goes, uh, we don't really go into a dormancy in California. Uh, we have absence of growth, but I uh, you know the control and the uh, manner uh, within the plant is, uh, you know, can be uh, mitigated to some uh, uh, extent. Uh, for example, uh, equidormancy, it can be uh, regulated by uh, temperature extremes, nutrient deficiencies, and uh, water stress. We do see uh, equidormancy in the uh, grapevines in uh, California. 
Uh, ectodormancy, this is uh, regulated by our physiological factors, such as our apical dominance and our photoperiod. We do see this in our California. Deep dormancy, uh, endodormancy, uh, regulated by our internal uh, factors, such as physiological factors uh, within the bud. This is uh, you know, uh, affected by the uh, chilling response of the plant, how much uh, chilling units uh, it accumulates, as well as the uh, photoperiod uh, prior to this uh, date. Commonly divided into a two, rest in our quiescence. Uh, quiescence, uh, we see uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's due to our cold temperatures, as well as our absence of uh, water uh, movement through the plant. Uh, the uh, rest conditions in California, as I mentioned, they're satisfied uh, very early. We only need about, uh, you know, 100 hours to uh, satisfy this. However, uh, you know, this is uh, removed, uh, you know, uh, very quickly uh, in the uh, January uh, thaw that we see in uh, California. Uh, most efficient ranges are going to be between uh, 3 to uh, uh, 10 degrees uh, Celsius to accumulate uh, chilling hours. So this is between uh, uh, 37 degrees uh, Fahrenheit to about uh, 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Most uh, accepted uh, for grape wines is uh, 32 to about uh, 40. Temperatures uh, above 56 degrees uh, Fahrenheit reverses the uh, chilling process in uh, grape wines. Uh, when we look at the uh, overwintering bud, uh, in this case, uh, when we had this uh, event, uh, shoots were uh, actively uh, growing. However, uh, when I uh, did uh, uh, assessments in uh, Clarksburg, Delta, Lodi uh, interior, I have seen uh, still a lot of uh, uh, ripe dormant buds that were uh, still uh, held back by uh, uh, acrotonia of these uh, uh, shoots, uh, which is different than uh, apical uh, dominance. Uh, as you know, uh, you know, the shoots have, uh, you know, a uh, paradigm and uh, bud acclimation. A lot of our uh, shoots acclimated uh, very well. They ripened uh, quite well uh, uh, this uh, last season because uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, sufficient amount of rain before the uh, killing frost uh, came. So uh, we were uh, okay in that sense. So uh, a lot of these uh, dormant uh, buds should be uh, okay. So the question uh, that I'm getting now is, uh, you know, uh, assessing damage. People do not have the uh, time or the ability to uh, assess these vineyards uh, on the ground. So they're uh, using uh, a lot of uh, remote and uh, proximal uh, sensing. The question is, uh, is going to be a pathway to sensing. The overhead imagery is uh, provided by uh, NDVI or uh, chlorophyll uh, images. These are uh, greenness uh, indices. Uh, before you uh, uh, process these uh, images, I would ask the uh, service providers to remove the uh, rows from these uh, images, which has a different uh, pixel number. And then a uh, fundamental uh, geostatistical uh, analysis is uh, then going to be uh, required uh, again. Uh, for uh, this uh, sensor-based uh, zoning is uh, what needs to happen. Uh, zones have to be uh, interpolated, but then uh, again, I, uh, you have to ask for the uh, spatial dependency uh, index of these uh, images. And uh, this is calculated by the uh, ratio of the uh, nugget to the uh, sill. And this uh, value runs from uh, zero to uh, 100. Uh, most of the uh, images uh, that we looked at uh, this spring had a spatial uh, dependency of uh, greater than uh, 25, meaning that uh, you know, our centers of the uh, vineyards uh, were uh, severely uh, affected. The outside peripheries uh, were uh, probably uh, keeping uh, warm due to uh, some sort of uh, environmental uh, influence that uh, they did not get uh, affected. Once you have the uh, spatial uh, dependency uh, understood uh, in these uh, vineyards, then they can be uh, zoned and then uh, uh, pathways to a uh, sampling can be done. Uh, most of the time uh, we can uh, get by with uh, two samples for our zone, let's say uh, severe damage versus uh, moderate damage. And uh, these are going to be uh, you know, uh, uh, quite accepted uh, uh, strategies to uh, you know, assess these damages based on the uh, severity of uh, frost that you have uh, suffered. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mark. He'll talk about uh, temperatures and uh, I'll be around to uh, answer questions. Apologize. Uh, sorry, Mark. Khan was supposed to introduce you, so I'm going to do that. Oh, Thanks, crap. Um, so, Mark, that oh, crap. Uh, I'm going to go for it. Don't interrupt me now. 
Mark Battinger is our Water Management and Biometrological Advisor in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Anita, very much. And I apologize, I'm on a very poor bandwidth, so I've had to disable my video. So I hope you guys can hear me okay. And my goal here is just to give you a quick overview of the temperature patterns that we see during frost events and how that might help inform us on how we respond to them. Okay, so we have two basic categories of frosts, an advective frost and a radiation frost. So the pattern that I show you there on the left is for the advective frost. And what we're looking at here is the air temperature profile at a good deal of height above the ground. 30, 40 feet above the ground, how the air temperature changes. These two different types of frost events have very different air patterns, air temperature patterns, and that is then going to influence what we can do to try to protect against them. So on the left, you see with the advective frost, um, oftentimes these freezes occur when we have, say, a cold front move into a region. They tend to be large regional events. Uh, maybe windy, maybe cloudy. So these are very challenging conditions to protect against because the air temperature gets colder with height above the ground or may, or, or may, may stay about the same, but oftentimes it's colder with uh, increasing elevation above the ground surface. In contrast, most of our frosts are radiation frosts, like you see the air temperature pattern on the right, where the air temperature is warmer with higher elevation above the ground. These clear skies and little or no wind. So it's important to understand what type of event you're dealing with because that will then help inform you how you respond to it. If, for example, you're going to use a wind machine or sprinklers, both of those will not work very well under an advective freeze, but both will work quite well under radiation type freezes. So ideally we would have information on this when we're trying to respond in the moment. Now, under our typical radiation frost conditions, if we look at the how the air temperature behaves close to the ground, it's under a similar condition, but it's even more extreme. So I'm showing you two air temperature profiles. If you look on the left, the air temperature where the uh, simulated cover crop here is very short, it has the same pattern where the air temperature is much colder near the ground, but the gradient of temperature change becomes very large the closer you get to the ground. So why does this happen? Well, it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive sometimes, but it's the surface that's exposed to the sky, that's exposed to outer space at night. It's what cools off, that loses its heat, and that in turn then cools the air near it. So that's what generates this pattern of having much colder temperatures near the ground surface. If you had an infrared thermometer and you pointed it at the ground, it would actually be the coldest reading in that environment. So even colder than the air temperature. So we can make use of this. It's an important thing to understand, but you know, for example, if we train our vines very close to the ground, we are putting them close to where the coldest temperatures occur. That's just something an important fundamental thing to keep in mind. Now the example on the right is the same pattern, but in this example, I've shown my cover crop being much taller. And what effect does this have? Well, that surface that is now generating the cold temperatures in this case is the top of that cover crop surface that in effect shifts these cold temperatures up higher above the ground surface. So this is why we often see very severe damage on frost events when the vineyard has a tall cover crop in place. What that has done is just lifted up the cold temperatures higher above the actual soil surface and exposed the vine tissues that much more severely to those cold temperatures. Our, our fundamental goal, though, if we do not have, for example, a wind machine or we're not using sprinklers, we're just trying to maximize the ability of that vineyard to store heat prior to the cold event occurring. Typically, what we want to do is have a bare soil surface, we want to make sure that there's some moisture in that soil, and that that soil is a little bit compacted, not, not like an asphalt surface, but has enough contact between soil particles such that during the daytime, when the sunlight hits that surface, that the warmth can be absorbed and conducted deeper into the soil. And then in turn at night, that same heat can be conducted back to the surface and released to help keep the air temperature from dropping as low as it would otherwise. In contrast, on the right, again, this example with the tall cover crop, 
that has the opposite effect. You know, that's going to insulate the soil surface from the warmth of the sun and is going to insulate the air from receiving any warmth that might be conducted back from the surface. So right now, you know, we, any grower, you're faced with this conundrum. You know, if you want to have a soil surface that offers you the maximum protection or that the maximum warmth, that will not provide you then the benefits of having a cover crop. So we always face a compromise. So oftentimes you'll see growers will use a, a mixture of you know, one row uh, tilled bare, the next row with cover crop. And that's, that's usually a, a beneficial compromise. The other obvious thing, I just wanna make sure you have a slide here though to show it, is that cold air is dense, more dense than warm air. So if there's any slopes involved in our vineyards, the cold air is going to very gradually flow downhill and accumulate in the lower areas. And certainly everybody has probably seen patterns where the areas that suffer the most frost damage tend to be these lower pockets where you can see the cold air accumulating. Now here to me is, is a really important concept and we, we have a lot of technology available to us in our vineyards to understand conditions, but we are committing a fundamental flaw in how we measure conditions during frosts. So I've shown a diagram here of a, a temperature sensor, the shielded air temperature sensor here, which is measuring the temperature of the air, the T air. That's a standard temperature sensor like most of us have either on our own uh, weather stations or on weather stations in the area. The important thing that measures air temperature, and that's why it has that shield over it to protect that sensor from being exposed to outer space at night, to the blackness of outer space, because if that same sensor was exposed, it would read colder than it would with that shield on. But what happens here in our scenarios of whether or not we have cloud cover, an example on the left, when you have a lot of cloud cover at night, say full cloud cover, the temperature of the vine foliage is going to be about the same as that shielded air temperature sensor. Why is that? Because the vine is not exposed to outer space, the sky. When you have partly cloudy conditions, the temperature of the vine tissue that you're concerned about are going to be a little bit colder than our air temperature reading. And then the example on the far right, when you have very clear skies at night, the temperature those vine tissues that we're concerned about might be substantially colder. How much colder? Maybe four or five degrees Fahrenheit colder than what our air temperature sensor is telling us. So that is a fundamental um, shortcoming in how we typically measure air temperature conditions as far as understanding what is actually happening within our vineyards. So how, how can we improve our, our measurements here? Well, that picture on the left, those are uh, examples of sensors which are designed to mimic the temperatures of foliage uh, on vines or other crop during the nighttime during fall. So there's two you see there, a, a black globe, that's just a hollow copper sphere with a sensor inside, and then a small plate, a black plate. Both of those will mimic the temperatures of those foliage very well. And on, on the right, that's just a tall pole that's designed to measure the temperature inversion conditions. So that to tell us fundamentally what type of frost event do we have? Is it an advective freeze or a radiation freeze? So with that, just a, again, a very short overview to hopefully help guide us in what type of data we can use to respond to frosts. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And so next up, we have Larry Badica, Viticulture Farm Advisor, in Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz counties. Thank you, Larry. Well, thank you, Anita. <clears throat> so I wanna talk a little bit about mitigating spring frost as far as what you do once you've got the damage. And uh, again, uh, there have been some studies in California looking at uh, how you handle frost damaged plants. Uh, some of the early work in California was done by Winkler and was published in 1933. And again, at that study, he actually uh, promoted the idea of when you have a, a certain level, a degree of damage, and when it's severe damage where you get 100% burn back, you do nothing because essentially the vine will respond and and will push out buds either from uh, 
the, uh, the secondary or tertiary bud within the compound bud, or it'll push buds out from maybe the, the basal whorl, and you would get fruiting from that potential recovery. The problem being is when you have partial dieback of a shoot, uh, and that, that primary shoot or count shoot uh, does not die back all the way, that's going to prevent uh, some of those secondary and tertiary buds from pushing. And so his idea was if you took those out, you would promote that type of growth and get maybe better recovery of a crop. Again, uh, there was a, a frost in 1960 and people who were following that practice did not get a very good response. And so then he came back and looked at that again and kind of corrected that and saying, well, when you have more mature shoots, that frost in 1960 was uh, in May. And so at that time, the shoot growth and the base of those shoots was relatively woody. By breaking those out, the thought was that possibly you were taking out, either taking out those, those, uh, those secondary buds or they were that wound, uh, making that wound, you got some dry back and again, prevented those buds from growing. And so they did not get a very good response. And so then he modified that saying the breakout of the shoots should be probably when the shoots are more herbaceous, maybe, you know, the three to six inch length. And then for more mature shoots, it may be possibly those shoots should be cut out at a very low level to prevent the damage to the secondary and tertiary buds within the compound bud. That work was then followed up by uh, Jim Leiter in 1965 and uh, Kaz and Madison Kistler did another study uh, was published in 74. And they were kind of counter to uh, Winkler's uh, reports and that when they did these shoot removals, they really didn't get very much recovery of, 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 of yield. And again, they were primarily looking at yield. Again, there are some other considerations and that was somewhat covered in this Jones study. It was in uh, Tasmania. That in addition to maybe yield recovery, there are times when you might wanna be thinking about what kind of shoots you are growing for the following season. And so again, sometimes there may be a benefit in doing some shoot removal or lateral shoot removal uh, to promote better shoot growth to, to hopefully then uh, get full crop recovery uh, in the year following the, the, uh, the uh, frost. So again, the, the, especially the last study that was maybe a little more detailed was a Casamaz and Kisser study. Their, their bottom line was in many cases, you just don't do anything. You just let the vines recover. Um, you typically will, are gonna see a loss of, you know, a certain percent yield depending on how bad the damage is. But uh, oftentimes that work of going in there and removing shoots uh, is not going to be recovered uh, by increased yield. I want to show you just uh, maybe some of the scenarios. And so here you see in the, uh, in the left hand uh, frost occurring at a very early stage of growth. In this case, these buds of uh, these shoots have been killed. Uh, in this case, you hope for two things. You hope that maybe that these the tertiary and secondary bud are still viable. If not, then these basal whorls will grow or possibly some uh, buds, uh, latent buds on some of the older wood will grow and you'll get at least shoot recovery and maintain those positions. Again, any potential fruiting uh, that you're gonna get back and recover is gonna be based on how fruitful those secondary buds are in account nodes or how, how fruitful they are in, uh, on, on, the, on the basal buds also. Another, maybe a little further development, and so this three to six inch shoot growth, when you get severe burn back and these shoots completely die back, again, hopefully you're gonna get some secondary growth from the, from the buds here and might get some partial uh, recovery based on, again, by fruitfulness. Uh, the problem is, is as these grow, and especially like on this bottom photo where you've got, uh, you know, shoots that are probably 12 to 18 inches long, uh, you've got severe damage to the tips and the upper canopy. The lower canopy, though, is relatively uh, unscathed, but here you see almost a complete loss of the, uh, the clusters. A complete loss or maybe some, might be some partial clusters here survive. And sometimes you don't know that until you almost get to bloom, uh, whether any of those remaining will, will sit. When they're very severe, you generally know right away because those clusters 
probably within a few weeks will dry up and fall off. But again, this is the case where, where you're gonna, with, with the fact that you have these shoots here, you're not gonna get a lot of, uh, and th these will start pushing lateral shoots and um, you will not get a lot of regrowth due to from the, from the secondary uh, and tertiary bud within that compound bud. Again, uh, in this case uh, where you have the complete loss of cluster, uh, the question is, do you just leave it as it is? Uh, you kind of sometimes have to wait and see how those vines are gonna respond and how they regrow. And, uh, but in many cases doing nothing is still the best option. So if you go and wait a couple of weeks, like we've now had a couple of weeks, I think uh, if you have vineyards that are damaged, you, can, you, you know what you're gonna get. And so here you see, again, a, a case where not only did you get the, the, the loss of that emerging shoot, you most likely also got damage to the, the, the other buds within that compound bud. There's nothing regrowing, but what you're getting as regrowth is, is either a basal or potentially you're gonna get uh, 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 shoots regrowing from, from uh, the older wood. And again, any fruit you get at that point is gonna be based on how fruitful those buds are. And again, there can be a pretty wide variation amongst uh, varieties. The picture on the right, again, is, a, is, is another vineyard where again, you've got pretty much complete loss of the primary shoots. Uh, you're getting now regrowth, uh, developing maybe a little further than the picture on the left. And, and again, you, you reestablish the, uh, the uh, you know the positions. Hopefully, maintain those. Here you see a shoot that uh, was a primary shoot that looks like it survived, uh, died back, but there is a, there's still a green cluster here, which very well may uh, produce some fruit. But uh, again, it's going to also produce a lot of laterals, and so that's what you see here is maybe a, a vine that's less damaged, which is good, uh, but you have a, a variation. You've got count shoots that are relatively unscathed by the frost, look like they have normal clusters that will probably uh, produce fruit. Uh, here you see a, a primary shoot there where the tip is lost. And again, you're, you see some leaf damage, but again, here you see that what the response is by the vine is that it's gonna produce lateral shoots. And so that shoot will continue to grow. And again, uh, whether these clusters are damaged or not, sometimes you have to wait a while to see uh, what happens. But this might be another case where maybe nothing is necessary. And uh, this vine, which the damage isn't too bad, you might actually have a relatively decent cropping. Then the question comes in, uh, do you need to do any kind of canopy management if you get excessive lateral development? And so you might need to pull some laterals or do some kind of leafing to open those vines up uh, to, to prevent a, a density issue within the fruit zone. Of course, the biggest concern or the, a major concern oftentimes is uh, the variability of damage within the vineyard. So here's a, a good example of Mark mentioned before how cold air flows and, and so it's dense and so it moves to the lowest spots within a vineyard. And so here is a vineyard that has somewhat of a bowl within this swale. And uh, this is probably several weeks after a frost event, you see essentially no damage up on these higher elevations and increasing amount of damage with the greatest damage having occurred at the bottom of this uh, swale. Uh, but again, here you see vines are recovered. And so again, what cultural practices you install, in this case, there was nothing was done. And so the vines responded, the ones that were damaged uh, have started to regrow and uh, that was pretty much all this, this on this site, which what they did. And so again, it was a small percent of the vineyard. And so probably did not make it worthwhile to do much more other than wait and see. And hopefully, uh, uh, you know, you know, the vines grow, outgrow uh, the damage and kind of at least reestablish those positions for the following season. The other concern, uh, and then Mark touched on this, is uh, you know when you have young vines, especially uh, second year vines that you might be training up uh, uh, the stake, uh, those vines are close to the ground and they do get uh, severely burnt at times. And so here you see uh, some severe damage. Uh, here you see, uh, these are the, this is the same two plants. Uh, you see a, a, a damaged 
chute coming out of this uh, melt carton. But again, as you remove the melt carton, you see there was some damage in the carton, but there's also another chute there. And so this vine probably will have no, very little impact. You've got other uh, uh, chutes here that you can train up and uh, remove this one. Uh, even in the event that this one is not fully uh, damaged, uh, if, it, if it was the only chute there, it, it most likely will push some laterals and you'll get some, some uh, recovery and probably minimal impact on that plant. The, the concern is one they get severely damaged with very low temperatures is not only the loss of that green tissue, you've got to be concerned on these young plants, is, is there any impact on the, the, the stem uh, of, uh, of the base of this, whether it's a scion or even the, the rootstock that's above ground. And again, oftentimes these vineyards have to be closely evaluated and looked at. And again, if you go in after the, uh, the, the damage has occurred uh, and you start to cut into the, some of these rootstock cylinders, and you either see dry tissue, very dry tissue, or uh, the start of uh, some uh, brown uh, uh, streaking in here, uh, that's an indication that maybe those vines were, were damaged and there might be some carryover effect uh, from that damage and those vines might have to be replaced. And so sometimes only time will tell you exactly uh, what will happen. But again, we have seen in the past uh, some of these vines where they do get damaged uh, at a very early stage uh, struggle through the rest of their life as a vineyard. And so at this stage, if you think there's some severe damage to the, the, the vascular tissues, it's oftentimes better to replace those plants. And with that, I'll stop and I guess we'll open it up for some questions. Great. Uh, thank you to uh, Khan and Larry and Mark for your presentations. At this point, I'll remind everybody that you're welcome to uh, either raise your hand um, using under the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom page, um, or you can put your questions in chat and Anita and I will, will read them. Um, so while we're waiting for people to do that, maybe um, there was a question that came ahead of time, and I think it was maybe related to what you were just talking about, Larry. So I'll ask you first. Um, so how do, you, how do you know when you when the plant just needs to be replaced? Is it a good indication that if there's something green coming out of, if you have leaves, shoots coming out, that it's probably going to be okay? Or do you need to do what you just showed on you know, your recent slide where you're looking down into the plant to see what's going on? If you get immediate regrowth and that growth is very strong, odds are that plant will survive. If you see something that comes out and just struggles, then that's the concern. I mean, generally, uh, it's the same thing as if you break a sh shoot when you're training those and they, they usually respond by growing another, pushing something out and growing relatively uh, you know, vigorous. Uh, but if it's sitting there and it's struggling, um, and even if it's not struggling, I mean, if there's, it, it would have to take relatively cold temperatures, more than just a marginal frost. But I think if you get down in the, you know, mid twenties or so, you do have the potential of maybe getting some, uh, you know, vascular tissue damage. And it, it, it's, it's hard to really see that. And it really takes a lot of experience to cut into those trunks and see, is it dry? But if the wood's dry, or if you see vascular streaking, they're more, more likely there is some damage there. Then a lot of times those plants will survive, it's, it's, but they never fully recover. And so there's always some vascular compromise there. And uh, I've seen plants where you can get them, you can train them out, they look okay, but as soon as you put a crop on there, they just don't have the potential to, to ripen that crop. And so if there's any question at that very, very early stage, you're better off replacing those plants. Gotcha. Uh, Rob, do you want to unmute and, and ask your question? Absolutely. Um, so what I'm hearing here is if I've got dead growth, leave it. I've already got some basal push. Uh, my, my shoots are three to six inches. Um, I want to cut off the dead growth. This is my fourth season. So yeah, you, you guys are the experts. Don't cut it, just leave it. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's probably not uh, economical to uh, 
send a crew to uh, clean that up because anytime uh, you put someone in the field now, even even if it's someone uh, doing a box pruning, you're spending $120 an acre on uh, just labor alone. So it might not be uh, rentable to do this. Now, uh, there might be another uh, situation where, uh, you know, those uh, rabbit ears were uh, left and uh, the uh, top of the uh, shoot was, uh, you know, uh, killed with this uh, frost due to, uh, you know, Acratoni, uh, the uh, uh, first and the basal bud might be uh, pushing out. It might be uh, worth it if you're uh, vertically uh, integrated. But then again, uh, like Larry said, uh, some of those uh, buds uh, might also be uh, damaged, the uh, primary, but the secondary uh, is going to be uh, fruitful, but the uh, tertiary uh, and the uh, dormant latent bud uh, is hardly fruitful. And if you're looking at the uh, basal bud, compared to the, uh, you know, our primary bud, when you have uh, 2.2 clusters per shoot versus, uh, you know, 0.6 clusters uh, per shoot. So it might not pencil out to, uh, you know, uh, send someone to uh, clean these up. We're uh, obsessed with, uh, you know, uh, making uh, vineyards uh, look uh, nice and tidy, but grapevines <laughs> uh, do not have feelings. <laughs> One more question, and that is, uh, as far as next year, I've been told by some local uh, vineyard owners that uh, there's a very good chance that my vineyard will recover and next year possibly double the yield. Um, do I prune the same way as I always have or do I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, grapes are uh, very resilient uh, despite uh, what people uh, might say. Um, I mean, that's why, uh, you know, 80 to 90 percent of our previous seasons are previous season's growth is removed with our dormer pruning in normal uh, years because they always come back. <laughs> they always come back. Yeah, the, the issue sometimes is if that shoot doesn't die back completely, that base of that uh, and the base survives, you get a lot of lateral push. And so it, it, it makes for some very ugly looking spurs. And so then you have to question, do you want to go in there and do some lateral removal to at least clean up and but some of its appearance but it it, it will kind of complicate the, the the pruning practice depending on how they regrow sometimes the best thing is to have it completely die off if you're going to have it because then they grow back and they're pretty much you've got decent shoots for the for the next pruning season okay so we have a, a question in the chat um can you provide a strategy for suckering after a frost event how long to wait what to leave and what to remove and how to balance the vine a very simple question i my recommendation uh is always going to be the same uh shoe removal uh should be done at a uh, el stage uh, 16 to 17 uh i mean people are uh, rush out and uh, start removing shoots uh, when they're about like uh, three to five inches long and uh you know we publish this uh numerous times and we keep getting the uh, same question so in an event such as this uh when our frost has gone through and like uh, you know decimated these uh vineyards there's probably uh, no point in uh you know uh, uh suckering this uh vineyard uh, at this point uh, it just needs to make up for our lost carbohydrate if you think uh you need to uh sucker it or uh, uh, do a shoot removal, there might not be uh, enough crop on there to uh, warrant a uh, shoot removal. Let the uh, vine uh, grow. Because there's no uh, lack of uh, solar radiation in California. Um, I don't see the uh, point uh, in my opinion, uh, going out and uh, you know, trying to make this a uh, balanced vine, uh, whatever that might be uh, in this case. Because you know, let's say, uh, you know, you're in the north coast, uh, you know, uh, this Ravaz index is uh, between uh, uh, three and five. They might be at uh, three now as opposed to five. So there might not be any uh, economical uh, advantage to uh, spend the money to uh, do a shoe removal. So there's a, another, I guess, two questions from Kevin um, in the chat. Can you explain the difference between wet bulb and dew point temperatures? And then are young rootstocks more frost hardy than dormant bench grafts for replanting? Wet bulb is a mark question. 
Where's Mark? He doesn't appear to be here anymore. Yeah, I think yeah. He, I remember he said he has a bad internet connection, so he may have been dropped. Um, so, so, so a, web, a, a wet bulb temperature is measured with a wet bulb thermometer and has to do not only with the temperature, but the humidity. So the, the greater the humidity, um, if you have 100%, well, so if you have 100% humidity, you won't have uh, any evaporation, evaporative cooling. Uh, so your regular temperature and your wet bulb temperature would be the same. If it's very, very dry, your wet bulb temperature will be lower. Um, whereas the dew point is the temperature at which at a, a given humidity, if the temperature goes down enough, you'll get uh, condensation. And I have no clue on the other part of this, so I'm going to ask that part again for you guys. <laughs> Are young rootstocks more frost hardy than dormant bench grafts for replanting? Not sure what you mean by young rootstocks. Oh yeah, green growers. Green growers, or are they you're talking about uh, rootstock, uh, you know, rootings? Kevin, do you want to unmute and um, clarify what, what you'd like to know? Yeah, yeah, I meant uh, rootings. Uh, okay. We plant dormant rootings, and I'm just wondering if they do uh, come out uh, better in in colder climates. Probably because they are adapted to growing under colder conditions. They evolved under colder conditions in by vinifera, so they might do a little better. Yeah. Is that it? So I can ask the next question? Yep. Okay, next question is 039-16 rootstock. Replant more susceptible to frost damage than some other rootstocks. Is that 3916? Is that how I'm supposed to say it? Yeah, yeah. 3916. Yeah, you know, those rootstocks, uh, they're probably more susceptible, not to spring frost, but they're probably more susceptible to winter cold. Winter cold, yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, that's because of their parentage. And so we've seen some of the rootstocks that either have rotundifolia or rufatomatosa as a parent. They have a tendency not to harden their wood off very well, especially as young plants. And so, but that's more of a winter damage than it is a spring. You know, spring when green tissue, it's equally, it doesn't matter what plant it is, they're all equally susceptible to that cold. The rootstock factor is more during uh, the dormancy. Okay. So the um, next question from Ben Leachman. Can a severely depressed dew point cause more damage during a marginal frost event? For example, the temperature of the air is at 32.7, but the dew point is at 27.3. No, I can handle this one. You know, the, the key thing for the dew point, what that tells us is what the potential floor or minimum temperature we could reach readily is. So the dew point serves as Quite low, um, even though let's say at the moment the air is 32.7, um, that just tells us we have the potential for the remainder of the night to drop dramatically um, in air temperature. But as long as the temperature it doesn't actually get to that level, we still would not have more damage. It really just tells us what the potential of the temperature we could reach is. Hmm. We might have lost Mark. Maybe we can have him submit that as a written answer and we can send it out. Yeah, because he totally disappeared. Okay. Um, can, can you communicate with, with Mark, Karen, and ask him just to write that out if he can? Yep. Um, and, and another question. Um, It's about a uh, nutrient uh, management. Yeah what, yeah, what type of inputs, minerals or nutrients can benefit a vine to recover for a long time after a frost event? Again, uh, you have to wait and see uh, what kind of uh, crop uh, you have on the vine because uh, what determines uh, mineral nutrition is uh, growth, uh, you know, and our rate of uh, growth and uh, what kind of uh, sinks there will be. 
since majority of us uh, apply uh, mineral nutrition uh, via irrigation, via, uh, you know, injection uh, uh, through a drip, this can be uh, applied, uh, you know, uh, uh, whenever, uh, uh, realistically. So um, in my uh, opinion, uh, if you're uh, 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 like a bloom time, uh, petiole tester, uh, you know, uh, looking okay, I would not, uh, you know, uh, fertilize it uh, as you would have uh, with a full crop because looks like uh, we lost about 65% uh, of the uh, crop uh, on the vines now, uh, at least in the uh, areas that are uh, affected. So let's say uh, you were at like uh, 10 tons, you would be essentially uh, fertilizing it now for about uh, uh, three tons to the uh, acre. So uh, that's how I would uh, approach it. Uh, so excess uh, nitrogen uh, addition, excess uh, potassium uh, addition uh, is not really going to uh, benefit because this is going to uh, prolong the uh, hardening acclimation uh, process uh, later on in the uh, fall season because we never really have these, uh, you know, hard freezes to stop the, uh, you know, uh, uh, indeterminate growth of the uh, grapevine like uh, other uh, uh, fruit crops like apples, for example, set a terminal bud and that uh, growth ceases. Uh, like uh, in grapevines, uh, we do not have this. So, if someone is trying to sell you, like uh, you know, uh, you know, some kind of uh, snake oil, uh, you know, curative uh, uh, nitrogen uh, formulation, I would probably take that with a grain of salt. So no, this is another question from chat. If a vineyard is budding out and a small amount of snow has fallen during the day above freezing on the vine covering the buds, two inches or so, with a frost schedule for that night, are we risking anything by turning on the overhead irrigation for frost protection as if we would for a normal frost event? Hmm, interesting. I don't know. I don't know, that's a very good question. Um, snow usually uh, has this, uh, you know, uh, protective uh, ability, but I don't know. I never uh, faced this uh, situation. So no response to there? It's a hair scratcher. That's a Mark Batney question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have this one written in because Paul actually sent it earlier. I was gonna get to it. So we will add that to the list to, to Mark Batney. Um, Another question, how should I be approaching the Okay, you basically did fertilizing after yeah. the damage, right? You basically did yeah. that one. Um, so, so I have another question. I mean, okay. I guess related to planning for the future, if people are going to be replanting, are there trellis systems or pruning systems like cane versus cordon pruned, bilateral, quadrilateral? Are there systems that are less susceptible to frost or does it not matter? Yes, uh, it matters a great deal. Uh, actually, uh, Larry covered this in the uh, last uh, Grapevine uh, short course. I thought it was last year, Larry, but it was actually 2019 when we did the short course. So, you know, I'm still in the uh, COVID haze. But, uh, you know, single high wires, you know, uh, trellises uh, above uh, 54 inches uh, above the uh, ground are uh, less susceptible to these uh, uh, frost uh, events. Likewise, uh, in the uh, last event, uh, we covered, uh, you know, cane pruned uh, uh, systems like uh, Guyos. Uh, They're uh, very susceptible to these uh, frost events due to uh, unevenness of uh, bud breaks. So we have a question that was trending prior to uh, today. And Although we've touched upon some, upon some of the elements, I'm still gonna ask the question because I think it may just enlighten some things because this is a very specific scenario. So they say, we had severe damage in our young blocks, Asamia Blanc, um, second leaf and third leaf. How does one determine if one must replant the damaged vines? If I'm seeing some green growth returning, can I conclude it is a viable vine? Maybe. Maybe. It depends how strong it grows. I would go out and really start looking at the, uh, you know, once it starts to regrow, does the, uh, if you have any trunks formed or cordons formed, do they look normal? Does the tissue look normal? Does it look wet? Does it, I mean, if it's growing and it looks right, then you're probably okay. But then the, the, for something, especially like Sauvignon Blanc, which is a pretty strong grower, those shoots should be growing normally. If they're they're very stunted and, and they and they they just look like they're not growing right, then there's probably something wrong. 
Okay. So there's a second part of this um, question that you sort of answered, Khan. Um, so we would typically do shoot removal at the stage of growth, but during even the limited yield, we need to control production level costs. And you mentioned, yeah, you don't think there's much point in doing shoot removal if you have damage. Then say, what are the ramifications of foregoing shoot removal for the season, specifically in partially damaged for bearer vines? I wouldn't do shoot removal. You want that uh, vine to uh, uh, replenish uh, uh, carbohydrates uh, in this case. I mean, why would you want to limit uh, growth? Because 65% of the shoots are already dead. Uh, whatever is uh, pushing out is uh, going to uh, you know, photosynthesize and uh, you know, make this vine uh, you know, healthy. I would not uh, remove shoots. So asking a, a non viticulturist question here. Um, so part of the problem is many times you have a vineyard and you have some vines that show no damage and others that have damage, right? Mm -hmm. You say, don't sucker, don't do shoot removal on the damaged vines because they need all the growth they can get. What about the undamaged ones? Undamaged ones, uh, that's a matter of uh, debate. Uh, so when we did our uh, survey, we found out that uh, you know, uh, for crop control across California, only 12% of the uh, growers actually do a shoot removal for a crop con crop level control because you know everybody gets paid by the tons so and uh when we did the uh, work with uh you know uh different uh shoot densities reducing our shoot density uh you know per foot of row uh only uh improved uh you know uh, uh getting to a certain uh, bricks level uh faster however uh, it did not uh, necessarily uh, improve uh, secondary uh, metabolites. Uh, if you're like working with uh, red grapes, for example, it did not uh, improve, uh, you know, uh, tannins or uh, uh, anthocyanin uh, content at the berry. Of course, none of these are uh, transferred uh, into wine. Uh, what is, uh, you know, more effective uh, in those situations is uh, uh, irrigation uh, restriction. Okay. So, so, so we do have, we have about seven minutes left and we'll get back to questions in a second, but I just wanna take this opportunity to, first of all, uh, thank our speakers from today and also to thank uh, Karen for helping come up with the program and, and for Caroline for the logistics for this program as well. Um, we can't put on programs like this without them. We just show up and go online, but they work for many hours to get these programs ready. Um, I'd also like to just announce that the next two programs that we're having, I believe, are we're having a, a program to honor um, Andy Walker on the, uh, since he retired uh, last June, and that will be on May 19th. Um, so I think registration's open, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Registration's open, so you can register online. That'll be on campus. We'll have a reception at the end to honor his career. So that's going to be a great event with lots of good speakers. Um, and then a Grape Day on June 8th um, out at Oakville. Um, come in here, uh, not only see what Khan has going on at Oakville, but lots of other speakers will be coming out and speaking about uh, various projects going on in the field. So, um, with that, let me go back to the next question in chat. Uh, this is from Maria. Let's see, I think, where are we? Yeah. yeah. How would frost affect disease pressure and what st strategies should we apply? Well, you've got a lot of dead tissue there and you've got dead flower parts that you know maybe a partially damaged cluster. And so we know that from a botrytis point of view that uh, a lot of that Botrytis inoculum can reside on that dead tissue. And so there, there is a, an increased chance of maybe higher uh, botrytis levels. But again, those are also dependent somewhat on what kind of weather we have. And so, um, I mean, if that was a concern, possibly you could do some leaf plucking or run one of, one of these machines that might dislodge some of that material uh, out of the clusters or out of the fruit zone and reduce that. that uh, that issue. The other concern, of course, is, you know, even if you've lost all your crop, you don't want to stop 
your mildew control because you don't want to build up inoculum lead holes in the in the uh, in the vineyard. So even if you don't have a crop, you still need to have some level of uh, a program to prevent, uh, you know, a lot of mildew developing in those canopies. Um, of course, but then the third thing is if you've got a lot of dense shoot growth, I mean, you're, you, you know, you've also increased the conditions maybe for more disease from that point of view too then. And so then the question is, comes in, can you run a machine there to kind of thin some of those leaves out and open them back up? Or do you need to go in by hand and do that? And so that's gonna be kind of a decision you have to make based on your own conditions. So another question from Maria, she's on the roll. She's asking great questions. Will we see a more wider than usual and even ripening across vines affected? Yes, uh, you will. Um, uh, I mean, we uh, assume uh, 120 days to uh, uh, 21 uh, bricks. Uh, after that, uh, you know, uh, there's the uh, controlled uh, dehydration of the vine. So right now, uh, you know, uh, we're starting uh, 15 days uh, late uh, with these uh, uh, damaged uh, vines. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's going to uh, extend the uh, ripening period by another uh, 15 days uh, with this. Uh, depending on the uh, you know, size of the damage. But the ones uh, we have seen in uh, Clarksburg, uh, Delta, Lodi uh, interior, uh, Bakersfield uh, area, more than 70% uh, of the uh, management unit, let's say I, like, uh, you know, if a management unit is uh, 80 acres, 70% uh, of it, more than 70% of this is uh, damaged. So this is somewhat uh, you know, uh, within their uh, uh, margin of uh, error when they uh, mechanically uh, pick these uh, giant uh, blocks. So uh, 80 acres, you know, that would be, uh, you know, usually uh, uh, 800 uh, tons, like roughly about like uh, 40 loads. So this 80 acres is uh, now uh, probably going to do uh, roughly about uh, 320 tons. So, you know, uh, 16 loads. So I think that's uh, manageable uh, within this uh, realm that I, this delayed uh, ripening. Would you, would you expect there to be a lot of variability on the same vine or vine to vine or, uh, and how much variability would you see is, are we talking about one bricks, five bricks, 10 bricks? Uh, within uh, undamaged to damaged uh, vines, uh, if they're, uh, I mean, the big, big question is uh, where, we, where does uh, uh, damage uh, occur? Is, uh, you know, was there uh, you know, a virus uh, infection in these uh, vines? So uh, assuming uh, there's no uh, you know, leaf roll or uh, red blotch uh, virus, uh, there should be uh, not a whole lot of uh, variability uh, within a uh, vine to vine uh, in this uh, realm. However, uh, you know, uh, situation can be exacerbated if there's like a, you know, a leaf rolls and a, a red blotch in this case, it can be, a, you know, a difficult to uh, assess this. So again, uh, I mean, uh, we're going through this, uh, you know, a great uh, replanting uh, all across uh, California due to these uh, virus issues. We have a uh, much cleaner plants and a uh, much easier to uh, ripening our uh, conditions these days than we did, uh, you know, uh, eight to uh, nine years ago. Question, will green harvest be recommended to reduce the variability? Like dropping uh, fruit? No, yeah. no. Okay. It's not gonna have that much fruit to begin with. So yeah. you'd be lucky if you, you know, you know, you'd wanna probably keep everything you had. If... Okay. So I think with that, we're at three. Okay, there's one more question. Can I ask it very quickly? Mm -hmm. In small blocks, do you think that it would be feasible to pick a vine two times? The first for the fruit from primaries and the second <laughs> for the fruit from secondaries. Would you be able to tell the difference between the two at that time? In my mind, harvest is already over. Why do you want to extend <laughs> the harvest? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's possible. And uh, we did this work in a uh, uh, high desert, in a uh, uh, Tehachapi uh, desert. So we did this work. Uh, however, uh, that extends the uh, season to, uh, you know, uh, late November uh, Thanksgiving. So, yes, you do get a, you know, a great crop, uh, looks uh, very bright. However, the acidity is uh, like uh, immeasurable to uh, control in the uh, cellar. So 
Typically, uh, you know, uh, we would harvest at, uh, you know, uh, seven to uh, eight grams uh, per uh, liter of uh, titratable uh, acidity. Now we're at like a uh, 10 to 12. So it's very difficult to like, uh, uh, so the more you handle it in the uh, cellar at this like a uh, one and a half to uh, two tons uh, to the acre yield from the uh, secondaries, the more expensive uh, it becomes. But yeah, I mean, uh, if you uh, have to absolutely uh, pick this fruit, you know, uh, go for it. Okay, Who, who's closing, Dave, you or me? Sure, I'll close since you, you opened. Um, so I wanna thank uh, everybody for, I'll thank our speakers for, uh, for answering all those questions in their presentations. Thank you, Larry and Mark and Khan. Um, thank uh, Karen and Caroline again for organizing this and uh, Nita for co-hosting. Um, we look forward to seeing you at uh, upcoming events and uh, we'll let you know when the next uh, office hour is going to be scheduled, hopefully in that too distant future. And we thank all of you for attending and your attention. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.